sideline decisions. Uh, we're going to talk about who should be making these sideline decisions, what are consensus statements about team physicians, uh, and how to make sideline decisions based on real cases uh, which I've been involved in making the decisions myself. Consensus statements have been prepared for definition of the team physician as well as what you need to have in your bag on, side, on the sidelines to prepare for coverage of an event. These consensus statements were developed in collaboration with six major professional associations. These associations are AOSSM, ACSM, AMSSM, AAOS, AAFP, and AOASM. So we have six organizations coming together for who is a team physician and sideline preparedness suggestions. There are consensus statements for uh, these. Uh, this is the um, .com for you to go to to get to these through the American College of Sports Medicine. These are printable. Uh, I would suggest if you are covering a sideline that you review these uh, and make sure that you're prepared, have an emergency plan, and work with your other medical staff, including athletic trainers, to make sure you're on the same page, particularly for emergency preparedness. Team physician consensus statement. This was a decade of work. Uh, there are numerous consensus statements. Again, I would refer you to this uh, sportsmed.org uh, website. Selected issues for adolescent athlete, injury and illness prevention, psychologic issues, concussion, female athlete issues, and what we're focusing on here is sideline preparedness and team physician consensus statement. There's also a a consensus statement on conditioning of athletes for sports. All very helpful for us taking care of young athletes. The objective of this statement is to provide physicians, school administrators, team owners, general public, and individuals responsible for medical care with guidelines for choosing a qualified team physician and outline the duties that are expected of this team physician. So a lot of communication going into being a team physician and communication is key. And the goal really is to ensure that athletes and teams are provided the very best of medical care. The definition of sideline preparedness for the team physician is identification of and planning medical services to promote the safety of the athlete, limit injury, and to provide medical care at the site of practice or competition. And again, I would refer you to this Medicine Science Sports and Exercise ACSM publication uh, for further information. Medical coverage of games, uh, what's in my bag? Uh, this is very important that you know what is in your bag, uh, know where it's located in the bag, and these are three um, specific um, publications that I think are helpful for you to pack your bag. This is a medical bag, um, what's in it, uh, from Orthopedic uh, Knowledge Update by Eric McCarthy, who's in Colorado. Uh, so this is what is in the bag. Um, it can be different based on who you're covering the events with. Um, if it's a Division I team, uh, you've got a lot more backup than if you are a high school sideline physician in the middle of nowhere. These are the medications that um, are suggested to be in your bag. Um, certainly in football we need the bolt cutter, screwdriver, uh, for um, removal of the uh, face mask. Uh, the cardiac monitor defibrillator typically are available uh, through the EMS or the schools that we cover. This wouldn't be uh, in your bag certainly, but it would be a locker room sideline equipment. Uh, ability to brace the neck or legs um, and uh, IV solutions would usually more be in the EMS uh, uh, ambulance. If you have athletes who have their own medications such as asthma medications, inhalers, they should uh, bring them themselves and oftentimes the athletic trainer has their name and their medication and keeps the medication. 
Is it broken or sprained? It's very difficult to tell. Sideline decisions, you have to have them do functional things. These individuals really weren't able to put any weight on their lower extremity, so it's a pretty much a no-brainer that they're not going back in the game. you got to be able to walk before you can run. All of these ankles are sprained, no fractures. So you can see a varying degree of swelling and ecchymosis. No breaks, all severe ankle sprains. The ecchymosis can occur very quickly. Sometimes if we put an air cast on, that may change the way the ecchymosis and the swelling pattern is. See the one in the middle is diffusely swollen with a lot of subcutaneous swelling, but again, severe anterior talofibular ligament sprains, no fractures. Is this broken or sprained? These are fracture blisters on the left. You want to leave those clean and intact and not uh, bust them. Uh, the, there is a fracture on the right of the fibula where uh, the finger is pointing and you notice the significant swelling. So this is a fracture dislocation of the ankle uh, examples. Sometimes it can be pretty easy to tell. This is a silver fork deformity of a distal radius fracture in a skeletally immature individual, a football player that was stepped on. So he has a uh, Salter II fracture of his distal radius that would be described as significantly displaced dorsally. Uh, we have different protocols for um, sedation, IV sedation. In this situation, this was a long time ago, I did a hematoma block and did a reduction. This is something that you want to do this under sterile environment. And if you are using sedation, have a protocol at the hospital and not do this on the sidelines. On the sideline, we would splint it as it lies with some type of it can be cardboard. Uh, a lot of the prefab splints are out there now, and you just loosely wrap that on and put like a sugar tongue on the volar and dorsal aspect of the forearm. Displace fractures, splint them as they lie. You can apply axial traction as your assistant is putting on the splint. There's no harm with gentle axial traction. You can see this is a both bone forearm fracture of the distal um, aspect with significant displacement. Didn't go through the growth plate. Another question that comes up is when not to reduce a dislocation. If you are qualified, feel comfortable, and have done reductions, this can certainly be done on the sideline. If there is deformity at the level of the bone and not at the joint, you got to worry more about a fracture. So certainly you can have a pure dislocation of the joint, you can have a fracture, and you can also have a fracture dislocation. When I get concerned about reducing a dislocation, if it's open, such as a fracture about the hand and you've got grass in the open wound, you reduce it, then that contaminates the joint. If you're concerned about a fracture, skeletally immature, or an older individual with osteoporosis, if you reduce something that's a fracture, you could f cause further damage. And if you're not comfortable with the, with the uh, situation, oftentimes there'll be family present that are very upset because their um, person has been hurt. Um, and if you haven't reduced that joint, such as the, longer jo the larger joints, like a hip, or if you have a very uncooperative patient, get them to an emergency room. You can call ahead and let the person on the other end know what's coming, what's dislocated, what you think about the situation. Particularly in a knee injury, if you have a knee dislocation, you have to inform them that the knee was actually dislocated and the exam was significantly unstable. And in that situation, um, a vascular consult is necessary and workup for possible uh, arterial injury or venous injury is necessary. What about in the hand? Uh, proximal interphalangeal joint dislocations, a dorsal dislocation is shown on the left uh, clinically and then the upper right x-ray. Usually these are reduced before we get x-rays. Um, again, axial traction. Sometimes it's nice to put a glove on so that they can be reduced easily. Dorsal direction is more common. Do the reduction with axial traction. Sometimes this is done by the uh, another player, rarely the coach or athletic trainer or the physician. And on the lower right is a volar dislocation. It is important to get x-rays 
after the dislocation to see if there is any injury to the proximal phalanx. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get them in for x-rays, but this is important. And you also want to follow them for uh, range of motion. Uh, they can return to the game with buddy taping, um, but sometimes they will develop a boutonniere deformity, and this is an important um, injury to treat acutely with splinting and uh, making sure that they get their extension range of motion back. There are some dislocations that cannot be reduced. Um, this is a volar dislocation of the metacarpal, and the metacarpal head buttonholes through the volar structures. And the harder that we pull on this index finger, the more the finger trap causes the reduction to not be successful. Note this dimpling of the palm. Uh, that can be a vascular involvement injury uh, associated with a lot of swelling. So oftentimes these are irreducible. So if you don't get it the first time, don't keep tugging. Uh, get that person to an x-ray facility where radiographs can be done. And oftentimes this particular dislocation needs to be done open. The structures that uh, cause the finger trap, you can see in the lower left where the metacarpal head is volar in location, and it's the natatory ligament, volar plate, uh, going across, superficial transverse ligament, more proximal, and the lumbricals and flexor tendons that cause that Chinese finger trap and cause it to be irreducible. This is a thumb volar dislocation with the metacarpal head going volar, so this would be a dorsal dislocation of the first metacarpal phalangeal joint. You can see the sesamoids uh, x-ray there, and uh, this situation I did an intraarticular um, block and uh, had no trouble with the reduction. Uh, you can see where the hand is so sweaty it's important to use a glove and get good uh, traction on the thumb before doing the reduction. Certainly doing any block under sterile conditions is very important. And this is uh, doing this under sterile conditions, uh, intraarticular block without uh, epinephrine, xylocaine only. Uh, we don't recommend intraarticular injections for other joints, such as the elbow or the shoulder. These would be more IV sedation, and if you can't get it the first time, getting them to a ER facility or an x-ray facility for radiographs. This is uh, an example of that dorsal dislocation of the first metacarpal phalangeal joint and uh, what, it, uh, what it looks like. Again, the deformity is at the joint, not at the um, proximal phalanx. So this is indeed a dislocation without fracture. Important to get x-rays after the reduction. Example of a right ankle injury. You can see how the player in white gets wrapped up underneath the other player when the bottom of the shoe, instead of saying N-I-K-E, says E-K-I-N, that's a bad thing. So you can see what the deformity looks like. He's significantly externally rotated, and he had a fracture dislocation of his ankle. This is the sign for the doctor to come on the field. Watch how he gets wrapped up, makes the tackle, but his foot uh, is caught up underneath him and the grass. I suggest doing a axial traction with the shoe on. Don't attempt to take the shoe off. See if you can do a gentle reduction immediately after the injury occurs. That's a little easier. Uh, another player tries to pull him up. Fortunately, he was with it enough to say, no, I can't get up. This is another area to, co to coach your players on, so to speak, of don't get a play, pull a player up, allow them to lay on the ground so that no further harm is done by his weight bearing on his fracture dislocation of his right ankle. Reduce it with the shoe on and sock on. Then get him off the field, take the shoe and sock off, and get an x-ray. This is another example of fracture dislocation of the ankle. Uh, this um, um, Running back, going forward, going forward, he gets tripped up, and you can see how his ankle, again, is externally rotated, gets uh, caught from behind, almost in the end zone. Pulled down from the behind, uh, face mask, I think. Um, so he has a fracture dislocation of his ankle.
So suggestions with uh, fracture uh, dislocations of the ankle, uh, reduce it, gentle axial traction with the shoe on while on the field. Um, have a plan to get the injured player off the field, um, whether it's with, with other players that are tall enough um, or a um, uh, rolling uh, gurney or some type of a uh, seated um, device, uh, x-ray them and immobilize them. This is a uh, left uh, foot subtalar dislocation. Uh, this uh, running back will take the hand off, and again, he gets tripped up. Uh, watch as he goes down. It's his uh, left um, ankle uh, that he's grabbing. He does get up on his own volition, starts jumping around. His coaches um, uh, think it's not much of a big deal. They help him to the sidelines. And we are right there. This occurred on AstroTurf, so he gets tripped up. Not actual contact there, but as he comes down, he rotates, and boom, he has a fracture, disloca or fracture of his subtalar uh, joint with some small fractures of his midfoot. We've got him on the sidelines. Uh, we're taking his sock off. Uh, you notice that uh, we're applying a little... Uh, posterior pressure and you can see where this looks like something is not in the right place. So this is a lateral subtalar dislocation. Uh, we get him inside, uh, talk to him, tell him what we're going to do. So this literally is only about five minutes from the initial exam on the sideline. See how much swelling he has? So you always want to do a neurocircuitory status check, uh, check pulses, check sensation posterior tibial artery, vein, and nerve could be injured. We're taking his pads off. And you notice I'm putting uh, gloves on. Uh, I'm not giving him any medication. I'm talking to him and telling him what I'm going to do. Have somebody put traction go in the opposite direction, and then clunk goes into place. So in this situation, I felt it was better to go ahead and get him reduced and then get some x-rays. Very easy reduction applying axial traction. And again, you notice from the initial time taking his sock off, just a five minutes layered later in the lower right hand, how much swelling there is. So if you do have an athlete that's many hours away from an x-ray facility, if you have someone qualified, a closed reduction will result in a better result, less likelihood of nerve injury. This includes a knee dislocation. Don't leave a knee dislocation unreduced. If you can get a qualified person to reduce it immediately, there's less chance of injury to uh, nerves, arteries, and veins. As I mentioned, put gloves on, axial traction, have somebody pulling the opposite way, tell the athlete what you're going to do, and oftentimes, acutely, right after an injury, they don't need IV sedation. They cross over on that back stretch only one and a quarter times around in the men's 500 meter. That is the final turn, and they are... And he goes going down, down. No, and he takes and he wipes, off. He wipes off the skater. Yost went down. Vettemars was hit and may be caught as he is hanging on to that left elbow. So this situation is one that you need to get to them. They're on the ice. You have to have a plan if you're covering uh, ice hockey or speed skating of getting to them on the ice. This is a situation where I wouldn't try to reduce this anterior dislocated shoulder on the ice. You don't have any traction uh, force. You see they have um, they have uh, tennis shoes on, uh, variations of gurneys, and making sure that you can get on the ice. Sometimes you need assistance from other uh, athletes who can skate to get to a player on the ice. So you have to have a plan for different surfaces as well. In football, oftentimes you can get up underneath the shoulder pads to tell is it more of a glenohumeral problem, is it more of an AC joint problem. This individual had had an anterior uh, recurrent subluxation of his right shoulder. We already had a harness on him. 
and you can see how you can get up underneath the pads. Athletes don't like to take their pads off because then they know they're finished for the game. So if you can at least give them an initial exam. So I'm rocking him forward, anterior, and then posterior. And we did take his pads off to do a full exam. So you do need to get to the joint, but you can start off pushing on to see if it's more of an AC joint or glenohumeral uh, joint problem. He was significantly weak, and we didn't let him go back into the game. I like doing exams of the shoulder with the individual seated. So he had no weakness, fortunately, in the deltoid, so the axillary nerve was okay, but he did have some weakness in the in external rotation, um, and he was not allowed to go back in the game. Our harness didn't work very well. What's the best way to reduce an anterior dislocation? I like the Hippocratic method of putting my foot on their chest wall, not on their axilla. You don't want to injure the uh, axillary um, neurovascular uh, structures. Apply traction downwards, lean into them. Uh, you need to have a bench, uh, or you can also do it on the ground, so you need a wide enough table or a bench to be able to reduce them. And again, I've got gloves on, apply axial traction, and oftentimes it will go into place. There are other ways to do shoulder reductions. Get used to doing it the way that works in your hands um, and practice on each other. This is a way to do it uh, prone. Uh, Sometimes people with recurrent shoulder dislocations will hang, hang weights on their wrist and it will pop back into place with that uh, traction. So you can do this uh, applying axial traction and the table basically is your counter traction. This is an example in Rockwood and Green's um, uh, older textbooks of the Stimson technique with a closed weight, uh, and usually the uh, shoulder will gradually go back into place. There is a dislocation method where the athlete reduces it themselves, um, and this is shown here where they're rocking back on their knee and pulling uh, forward, so he's leaning back, and this applies um, the forces to relocate the shoulder, and this has been successful in some individuals when they can do it to themselves, so to speak. The hardest dislocation to get back in is the first one, and sometimes the athlete can then self-reduce themselves, and they may only be subluxing as opposed to truly dislocating. Elbows can look pretty ugly. Uh, this is a elbow dislocation. Typically, these uh, reduce themselves. We don't see a lot that are still uh, not reduced when they get into the emergency room, but you can imagine the neurovascular potential problems uh, with the brachial artery, ulnar nerve, median nerve, um, and certainly these uh, individuals cannot go back and uh, wrestle, so it's a uh, land on an extended elbow uh, with a dislocation of the elbow. You want to make sure, particularly in the skeletal immature, that there's not a medial epicondyle fracture that's displaced in the This is another example of professional football. Um, stiff arms him, goes down on the turf and has a uh, dislocation of his elbow. Important to do a good neurocircuitory check. Uh, make sure there's no uh, injury to the brachial artery. Check their radial pulses. Do an Allen test on them and check them neurologically. If they are not reduced in a posterior elbow dislocation, you can reduce them with them uh, being um, in a prone position. Again, the table use is what you use for your counter traction. Put gloves on and then just basically pull straight down. Uh, and this has been successful and you can extend the arm as you're doing this and pull straight down. So you will lever the hinge back into uh, place. Gloves do help. A considerable amount of force is required for reducing an elbow dislocation. It is nice to get x-rays before to know if you're dealing with any type of a fracture uh, dislocation. This is a 14-year-old football athlete. He was a center. Uh, he was pushing up to get uh, up off the ground after a play, and another player landed on the back of his humerus. So you can see where we're putting our thumb in his lecranon fossa. He has a posterior dislocation of his elbow. Um, a lot of pain. 
uh, and this is what his x-rays look like. So you can see in the lower right hand uh, posterior dislocation of his elbow. It's a little hard to see where that medial epicondyle is, but the medial epicondyle, as you can see on the AP view on the left, you can't really see it on the oblique view and the other view. So you do, do need to get a post-reduction x-ray and that medial epicondyle uh, may need to be fixed. The ulnar collateral ligament um, may um, not need to be fixed in acute elbow dislocations uh, because there's a significant amount of stiffness. So this would be something to probably do an MR um, in this day and time um, in addition to post-reduction radiography. This is a 14-year-old who um, had attempted reductions of her elbow dislocation multiple attempts at the gym by her father and coach who were two different people outlying emergency room they kept pulling and pulling you can see that little red dot indicates that there is vascular injury she had a brachial artery um, thrombosis uh, which required revascularization so if you have an elbow dislocation I feel it's better to get them to an ER facility that knows how to do a reduction uh, as opposed to those in outlying areas that are not comfortable don't have somebody trained to do this uh, on site. This is what her elbow dislocation looked like her uh, x-rays show her to be skeletally mature This is uh, an example of um, a very harrowing worst experience on a sideline. Uh, reinforces that you really do need a plan for an emergency uh, team. Um, this is Chucky Mullins who played for Ole Miss. Um, you can see his um, neck pretty much disappears and if you look at his left arm he already has uh, a significant neurologic event where he's an immediate quadriplegic. He had immediate paralysis. Um, he had a multiple level cervical spine fracture dislocation. Uh, he was uh, treated um, very properly and emergently on the field. Um, they uh, kept him breathing. Um, they put him on a spine board um, and got him to um, the local facility uh, and then he was treated uh, in Memphis at a larger uh, facility, a uh, center for spine trauma. Um, unfortunately, he died four years later, but you need to have an emergency plan. Um, need to talk to the EMS folks. Um, usually we try to keep a helmet on and remove the face guard so that we don't cause further injury to somebody that's neurologically intact by taking their uh, helmet and shoulder pads off. So you need to have an emergency plan before this happens. Return to play after fracture or dislocation, it should be teamwork. It shouldn't be a tug of war. Um, you're there to, to protect the athlete, uh, and you're the one that should be making the decision about returning them to the field. Uh, the athletic trainers are very, very helpful in making this decision as well. They make a lot of these decisions at practice and at games, but if it's a significant injury, then uh, usually the physician is involved to make that call um, at a competition or a game. You need to communicate with the coach to know that you're there to protect the athlete. He's coaching the game. You should be making the calls on the medical decision of return to play. It's a two-way street. The players should be educated on when to let us know if there's a problem, such as a burner or a brachial plexus stretch that's a not a central cervical spine problem, but more of a stretch. If they have a burner um, syndrome or a brachial plexus stretch, um, they need to let us know because they can have further injury to other structures, like dislocate their shoulder if they don't have strength. Um, we should inform the players what to do and what not to do. Don't pull up an injured player that's lying on the field and protect the injured athlete from harm at all costs. There is a code of medical ethics, ethical issue in patients' rights, and, a, and these codes are updated all the time. In this code, physicians should assist athletes to make informed decisions about their participation in sports which entail risk of bodily injury. This can be in a collision uh, sport such as football. It's like playing in traffic. Uh, injuries are to be expected. Um, but also we need to inform them of risk if they're not prepared um, with agilities, um, with conditioning, uh, such as uh, from heat illness, 
and also injuries to knees if they they haven't done the prehab, done the uh, strengthening and conditioning in the preseason. There is risk for bodily injury to the anterior cruciate ligament. And physicians must protect the health and safety of contestants and judge removal for the event by medical consideration. We need to treat patients, student athletes, as you would want to be treated. And if you make a decision where you can't sleep at night because you sent a youngster back in, you got to question if you made the right decision. We don't want to get lucky sending individuals back in the sideline. We want to do the right thing always for the student athlete. Uh, negligence, definition of negligence, uh, which uh, doctors get sued for, but it's a conduct of a person that falls below the hypothetical standard of care established by law. And that's the standard of care. It's a breach of duty that the law has recognized. Breach of duty is the proximate cause of the resulting injury. And action to be considered negligent is injury that results from breach of duty. So we need to understand these definitions of negligence and what we're uh, potentially suable for on the sideline is being negligent and letting an individual go back in the game, perhaps not even examining them. So make sure you examine them and know what the situa situation is before letting an athlete go back in the game. I refer you to that reference of the athletic training in sports medicine. Who's driving the sideline decision train? I think it should be the docs. Uh, sometimes the docs are at the end of the train. I show here where the trainers sometimes get pushed to being in the caboose, which is not a good position. What we don't want to do is have the young athletes driving this train or the coaches or the parents. So the medical staff, the Physicians and athletic trainers need to be driving the sideline decision train on acute injuries and also return to play after surgeries are done. If you're in the one in the middle, protect the injured athlete and keep them out of the game. When in doubt, keep them out. Will Rogers said, even if you're on the right track, you will get run over if you just stand there. So you also need to physically get out of the way of the oncoming train, but you also need to keep up with advances, keep up with your team, make sure you know who's injured, who's not, who's back for the first time. And communication is a big key, particularly communicating with the athletic training staff. As a team physician on the sidelines, we must be the athlete's protector, advocate, and again, don't worry or lose sleep over your decision on the sideline. If that's happening, then you're letting too many go back in. It's a team approach. There's no I in team, so we might be driving the sideline decision train, but try to make sure you work with everybody uh, on your team. As a team physician on the sidelines, we also should share our experiences. The more communication, the better. Uh, share experiences about what your um, worst nightmare is on a sideline and how you were prepared for it and what you do different or the same in the future. So we should communicate with uh, other physicians, uh, primary care physicians, orthopedic surgeons, uh, athletic trainers, physical therapists, parents, and coaches. The more communication, the better. To make the diagnosis, we've got to observe mechanisms. No physical exams. We don't have an MRI scan on the sideline. We've got to talk to the athlete, get in their face, look at them in the eye, figure out if they're scared or not, um, and don't let them go back to play hurt or in a situation where they might harm themselves further. When I was um, in Kenya on a safari, not a medical mission, but it became one, uh, and you never quit being a sideline physician. So this uh, young landowner was gored by a three-year-old elephant. I assisted him uh, by starting an IV. He had his own IV solution. This is a little three-year-old um, uh, elephant. This is the Somali tribes that assisted me in starting an IV and cleaning out his wounds. So it's amazing how um, uh, nature uh, can um, come back to hurt you if you get too close to the space. On the sideline you can be run over by the oncoming uh, play. So you have to be heads up and wherever you are in the world you still are a physician and you may be called to be a sideline physician even with animal versus human. Thank you very much.